One of the highlights of this year's Melbourne Documentary Film Festival is a film called Solstice, a film that deals with mental health issues. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the director of Solstice, Helen Newman. Helen, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Great to talk to you. And this film, of course, deals with some very uh, difficult issues relating to mental health, suicide, that sort of thing. Tell me about the origins of the documentary. Yeah, so it began as um, a story about a local family who had lost their daughter to suicide. So I'm based in regional Australia in a town called Albury. And um 11 years ago, a family, a local family who were quite well known in this community lost their daughter to suicide and they were met with that, the shame and the stigma and the silence that can come with a, a death by suicide. And um, they're quite powerful, strong people and rather than sort of hide away, they um, made the decision to have their daughter's funeral in our, in our main square, in our main street of our town. And I think that set them on a trajectory to just push against that silence and really challenge the isolation that can come with losing someone to suicide. So I began following their story, but um, a lot of there were a lot of variables that then started to happen along the way. So the more I filmed them, I questioned what the film was. I didn't know if it was about youth suicide if it was about um, mental illness in young people, if it was about um, if it was about eating disorders because their daughter had died from an eating disorder, which is a very serious misunderstood illness. And so for I kept filming, kept following their journey, but I kept connecting with more and more people who had lost someone to suicide and who were really aware of how our mental health system is failing those who are most vulnerable. And so that became the trajectory that I then went on with the film. Uh, how interesting to hear all that. And uh, you certainly have followed that through. Tell me then about the other stories, the uh, the regional uh, areas that you visited and other stories that you were able to uh, put together for your film. Yeah, okay. So I, the central spine of the story is about Annette and Stuart who lost their daughter, Mary. But from them, I connect with various other people, in, including a woman in a small town nearby who has lost three men in her family to suicide. So as a young teenager, she had her first experience of what happens when someone dies by suicide, the, you know, the conversations that don't happen, the people that withdraw, the isolation she lost her uncle and then she lost her father and then her most recent loss was actually her husband. So this woman again has said, enough, I refuse to be silent in the face of this and we need to be doing more. So she's one of the people. We also meet um, Joe Williams who survived his own his suicide attempt and has then again gone, recognised that more needs to be done in the space and that's what he dedicates his life to doing. And another young woman, Connie, who lost her partner to suicide after he returned from several tours of Afghanistan. He came back with really quite damaged physically, but also really quite bad PTSD. And then spent over two years trying to get help. Um, and again, was unable to reach the help he needed and eventually took his life. Um, he felt he had nowhere else to go. He felt completely trapped. And as um, the other people that I interviewed in the film, I've interviewed Patrick McGorry, he's a world export, expert on mental health, particularly in young people. And as he says, so many of these suicides are preventable. And that's, I think, what drove me to keep making this film was there needs to be change and change is possible if we look at, look at dealing with mental ill health in the same way that we look at dealing with physical ill health. And it's the conversations that happen at the grassroots, I think, that can start to create that change. So, um, yeah, there's quite a few voices in there, but they've all got a fa fairly similar message. Well, well done on that because, yes, the message is so important and and having mm. systems in place and having um, social recognition of this area so people can actually talk about these issues and so something can be done, I think is an important message in your film. Thank you, yeah. And I think probably for me too what was really important was ensuring that suicide is a really heavy topic, obviously, to be 
to be following and um, ensuring that the hope was not lost in that because each of these people that became part of this weave of stories um, have incredible hope and determination. And so one of the, the important um, threads for me through it was the hope that's in there and the change that's being created. I wanted this film to be a document that was empowering and I feel that um, it does that quite well. Absolutely. And, and of course, there are other issues brought up in the film, such as uh, COVID and lockdowns um, and uh, fires that uh, impacted on people regionally and, and of course, the impact on First Nations people as well. Yeah, yeah. So I'd been filming for um, two and a half years and the story, um, uh, the, the fires really changed, changed the trajectory of the story. Um, uh, you know, the, those black summer fires that engulfed much of Australia really impacted on so many communities and particularly one community near to us. And not long after those fires, that community experienced several suicides of, of young men. Um, and I couldn't move away from having to look at that story because um, suddenly we were seeing the, the mental health impacts of natural disasters. And that is going to be increasingly something that we globally are going to have to grapple with. And then hot on the heels of that, of course, we had the global pandemic. And I think, um, again, we saw people's mental health um, really being challenged around, around what that meant. And some of the more serious mental illnesses, people were not able to get the help they needed. Um, they were very isolated. And particularly around eating disorders, that became a time where eating disorder behaviours um, were exacerbated. Um, but what it did do was it meant we began to talk collectively about mental health. It wasn't a side issue. It was one that was daily in the forefront, I found, of public dialogue. So in some ways that helped create the impetus for moving the film forward. Okay. How much production did you have behind you? Because it's a really well-made documentary and you also Thank use you. some animation as well. Um, what was your process there in, in having that production? Um, well, we began with a budget of zero um, and, <laughs> and yeah, look, it just slowly, it was, it was partly funded by me. It was partly funded by local individuals, communities. So it began very, very grassroots, um, crowdfunded through Australian um, Documentary Foundation. It was put onto their platform. We got some crowdfunding through there. Gradually, we built up this story. And, and like all the other projects I've worked on, once you've got that strong proof of concept, then you can pull bigger players on board. And so I found a beautiful producer who came on and helped me get support. Um, ABC TV then acquired a short version of the film. And with that happening, it meant film um, screen Vic money was able to be accessed. Producer money from Screen Australia was able to be accessed. So then we had we had enough money to make this feature length film, which was which was fantastic. And you know, in terms of the animation, um, one of the really important themes through the film has been giving Mary, the young woman who is the centre of this story in a lot of ways, giving her a voice, even though by the time I'd begun the film, she had been dead for some time. And so it became really important for me to allow her to be a leitmotif through the film and to allow her voice to be something. And um, as a young girl, when she was studying English, one of the books that she connected with was Sean Tan's book, The Red Tree, which is centred around a young girl who is struggling with her depression. Um, and so Sean Tan beautifully allowed us to um, use his his imagery and animate it and that became Mary's but that is Mary's voice through the film then so we've been really lucky there's been a lot of kindness along the way okay oh well done on that and it's uh, and and of course this is your first feature uh, documentary you've made some a uh, couple of short films I've noticed um, so uh, the process of you making this film must have been somewhat of a challenge as well um, it was a challenge. I co-directed a feature length um, oh, about quite a few years ago now, um, and that was around refugees. It was called Anthem, and I co-directed that with um, a director called Tahir Canvas. 
but it's been a very long time between these two feature lengths. Ah. It was actually good to have that experience coming into this one because I knew what the demands are of making a feature length. I knew that it would own me as an independent documentary filmmaker signing on board a feature length documentary. I, I knew that it would be very demanding for a long period of time. So that was good. I knew I was in for the long haul. It wasn't, it wasn't going to be a few months. It wasn't going to be a year. Um, you know, just raising the money and keeping going and finding the support is a huge part of creating it. Oh, and well done on that. And uh, uh, I can uh, also imagine that there would have been occasions where filming some of the uh, individual stories and, and families and so on would have been very delicate and difficult and there um, might, have, might have been some ethical boundaries involved there. Yeah, you know, one of the things that really surprised me and I was reflecting on this the other day is how everyone who was interviewed was, um, of course, there's a process of building a rapport and getting to know that person and understanding their story and what the boundaries are of the story that is that you'll be telling and um, what questions will be appropriate. But there was a hunger. There was a real hunger in all of these people to be heard and, I, and not to be heard to... To, they're all each story is underpinned by a need to not see other people experience what they've experienced. So I think that drove the openness. Um, and also most of the filming I did on my own. Um, so I was <laughs> being many things. I was I was doing the interview and, and running the camera and setting up the lights beforehand. But what that did create was a, a very intimate space. So I think that also helped allowed us to gently move forward through the interviews as well. Okay, well, well done on that. So <laughs> quite an achievement. Tell me about the editing process because um, um, that's always a difficult part of the uh, the final composition of any documentary. Yes, yeah, and there's always, you know, they killing your babies, the ones you, the, the stories that don't get in even though you love them. Um, so most of it, I, I did the bulk of the editing myself. Um, and then I um, was really, really lucky to be able to take that edit down to a facility in Melbourne City Post. And I worked with Wayne Hyatt down there. And together we, we um, teased it and shaped it and mani manipulated it and um, had, the, had the grade done down there and a sound mix done down there. So that for me was a wonderful thing to have another set of eyes on it after having worked in isolation in a lot of ways through it. Um, you know, I made all the big decisions here on my own in my own edit suite. So it was good to have another another person reviewing it with, with a little bit of distance from it. Okay. Well, again, well done on that. That's, uh, again, quite a process. <laughs> Now, the film is going to be screening at the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival in July. How else will the film be screened and what, what are your hopes in terms of the, the messages that the film is presenting? Yeah, I really want to see it as widely as possible. It has screened in a couple of other festivals as well, um, here and overseas and some online festivals. I do believe that as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival, it will be streaming online as well. And that's my interest is really seeing it distributed as widely as possible. It has seemed to have resonated um, in America as well. So I'm hoping to see it yeah, distributed much more widely in the future. I think it's a really important, I really think it's a really important and, and the right time. I think now's the right time for us to be having these conversations and having them in safe ways. Exactly. I mean, uh, of late, I suppose people are, be, are able to be more open about talking about mental health issues and the impact it's had on them and others in the community. And your film certainly contributes to that uh, opening out of the discussions that are so important. Yeah, yeah. And I think for me, um, again, to reference Pat McGorry, it's great to be having those conversations what we need to do now is do that next step and, and challenge how we respond to mental health at a personal level. Like how do, what's our responsibility to people who are struggling with their mental ill health or um, having suicidal ideation? But and at, at a social level, how do we collectively as communities support and surround people who are struggling? But also then, really importantly, at a policy level, where do we put our money to make sure that people are getting the best service possible because obviously the system's failing. You know, I've, I've, 
making this documentary, too many stories of people who had sought help and ended up taking their life in, in abject despair. So I think my interest is really in seeing this be one tiny little part of that voice that pushes it forward. Oh, exactly, exactly. Uh, what response have you had from the uh, overseas film festival screenings and so on to your film? Really brilliant. Yeah, really brilliant. Um, I think that's the thing. I, I think I really am delightfully surprised um, to hear that it resonates with people. Um, there's often communication afterwards with people who have lost someone to suicide or have been working in the space that go, yeah, this is authentic it's it's um it's relevant it's important so that's been great that's been really affirming because you know as I, I said earlier a lot of this I, I kind of worked in my own little bubble a lot so to put to put your child out there and to go what do you think it's a little bit like um you know showing people your guts in a way to see <laughs> how they're going to respond to them it's it might you know filmmaking is a very vulnerable um process and craft and so I feel like it's resonating really well and um, I'm pleased with that. Oh, that's that's great to hear. And, of course, the title, Solstice, um, which mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of until I was watching the documentary, is referring to a an event, a community mm -hmm. event that's uh, so important. Yeah, yeah. So in our town square, from uh, one year after Mary died, her parents founded an event called the Winter Solstice. It's on the 21st of June. It is freezing cold. And our, our town square is filled with people who come to hear people speak about their own mental health struggles, speak about their loss of someone they've loved to suicide. Um, it's freezing, um, but we all come together. And I think there's something really important about that. You know, there's there's that, that collective uncomfortableness that draws us in closer together. And I think that's kind of what, you know, struggling with mental illness and having those conversations with them, it's a really beautiful analogy for that experience. And so, yeah, every every year, 21st of June, in our town square, we um we hold a winter solstice. And it's, it's a really special place where I see probably the safest place for a lot of people to be with their grief. That sounds great, and it's of course obviously coming up very shortly. So, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Helen, congratulations on the film. I must ask you, are you working on another film at the moment? At the moment, I've got some smaller projects, but you know, I'm I'm really happy to be working on ones that don't own me quite so much, because I'm still birthing solstice in a lot of ways. Still, the solstice is still going out into the world. So it's really great to have the energy to do that. Again, you know, independent filmmaker, it's about having the energy within yourself to keep pushing it forward. So, yeah, with that in mind, it's the way things are working for me at the moment are, are really good. Oh, excellent. And, of course, film, uh, documentary film in particular, can act as a, an agent of change. I suppose oh. there might be some political screenings, government, uh, et cetera, who want well, to see the Well, actually, we did, yeah, we did have a screening in New South Wales Parliament near to the end of last year, um, which was brilliant. So our local MP um, took it up to New South Wales Parliament and it was screened there. And we're also working to get it into federal parliament as well. That would be really wonderful. So working with um, independent member Helen Haynes to get it into federal parliament. Yeah. Excellent news. Uh, the film can have such an impact. So uh, congratulations on Solstice. We've been speaking to Helen Newman, who is the director of Solstice, screening as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival in July. Helen, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay,